have this recorded. And um, welcome to the sixth webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series. We are thrilled to have you all join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and expose you to opportunities for new understanding around this very, very, very important topic. This series is brought to you by the State Board for the Community and Technical Colleges eLearning um, and Open Education and the Assessment Teaching and Learning Offices. So Alyssa Sells, um, my partner in crime here at the State Board, is our co-host and we are thrilled to have you all join us for our Global Accessibility Awareness Day event, Making Accessibility Accessible. As you know, um, Alyssa and I love to have you experiment in these webinars, and so today we have some fun things in store for you. For starters, we're going to ask you not to use your mouse, and I'll just let that, I'll just let you all process that. We're all going to experiment with not using our mouse, and we'll talk more about that later, so just process that. And this is our first ever captioned webinar. So we'd really like to thank a la carte for partnering with us. They are sponsoring our live captioning service for today's webinar. We're very excited for this webinar series. And we have a beautiful presenter today, Terrell Thompson from University of Washington. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ter Terrell for sharing his experiences and his knowledge with us. Hey, Jen, so, can you guys hear me now? Yes. OK, my mic's still not working, but um, I'm using the mic on my laptop, so I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I'm not sure exactly where you're at, because I was trying to run the audio. Oh my gosh, no worries. No yeah. worries. And did you start the recording by chance? I did. OK, good girl. Thanks. I, my, <laughs> my pleasure. I'm so, <laughs> I am happy. So um, I'm just posting the ATL blog link, which is where we will be posting this recording for today. And um, I'm also going to post in um, the link to our recordings and resources, so you'll also know where to find um, today's webinar. And let's get started by running through a few Collaborate tools and doing a few quick group activities. And then we will introduce our wonderful presenter. Alyssa, okay. do, you, do you want to go ahead and do that? Um, actually, can I interrupt you for a second? Because I'm not sure how far you got in these. Um, did you have a chance to thank our captioning sponsor for today? I did, except I didn't okay. show the slide. Oh, <laughs> well, you're supposed to show the slide, silly. <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, again, I just wanted to um, thank a la carte for providing us with captioning services today. And to mention that this is our first captioned webinar that we've um, ever done. So if you want to see the captions, um, they're right above where my picture is displaying right now in the audio video panel. There's a little tiny icon that says CC. And if you click on that, you'll be able to display the captions and um, see what's going on as the presentation goes. You'll be able to read right along with those. So um, that's there for you if you need to use it or want to use it just because you're curious. All right, uh, let's see where else we're at. Thank you again um, for joining us today for captioning um, from a la carte. It's just, they, they just so graciously donated their services to us, and um, we're just really thankful for that. So it gives us a chance to um, test out um, something new. You know, Jennifer and I are very fond of experimenting during these webinars, and um, we do have some fun things in store for you today. So uh, look forward to maybe not using your mouse a little later. So we'll talk about that. And um, yeah, I'm just kind of excited to get started here. So uh, Jen, is this where we were at on the meeting interface? Yep, we're good. Okay. And again, I'd like to apologize for the rocky start to the webinar today. Um, my mic was working earlier before I uploaded files. I'm not really sure what happened. So um, gosh, thanks for putting up with, with us. All right, so this is our meeting interface. And this just has some arrows pointing to the various pieces. We have our audio video panel in the top left. We have the participants panel middle left, the chat panel 
bottom left, and then we have a whiteboard, which is where you're seeing the slides display now, and that's the arrow on the upper right. And then we have a skinny little toolbar in the middle there um, that are whiteboard tools that I have yet to figure out how to use um, with the shortcut keys. So uh, we'll see if we can figure that out. All right, we do have some participant tools. And from left to right, those are some emoticons where you can show your um, emotions about different things. You can give applause, a job well done. Uh, next is step away. If you need to step away from the webinar, feel free to click that button and we'll know that you've um, left the webinar for just a minute. We have a raise your hand. When you do want to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand and that will put you in numerical order and then we'll know to call on you. And then we have a polling tool that normally we use there. We are actually going to try working with that without the mouse today to learn some of the shortcut keys. So um, look forward to that. And your talk button is on when you see the little blue microphone next to your name. And then you have some various chat permissions enabled um, in the participants panel to use. All right, so this is our chat window. A lot of you have already found this. Again, that is on the lower left of the screen. And you can get there by tabbing around if you're not using your mouse today. And um, go ahead and type questions into the chat as we go, and we'll uh, moderate and visit those, um, usually toward the question and answer period at the end. Everyone's in the main chat room right now. We do have a moderator's chat as well, and there are some interesting little emoticons in the chat room area too, so uh, feel free to use those as well. All right, so um, looking at our whiteboard tools, um, Normally we do a little pointer exercise here, and um, Cheryl, do you know, because we were talking about this um, in our practice se session, and he's actually the one that showed Jen and I how to tab around this interface without using the mouse, do you know how to get into the whiteboard tools without the mouse? I don't uh, have all the keystrokes memorized, but they are in the help menu. And okay. I actually haven't looked at the documents that you shared. You, you might have some of the keystrokes as well. But if you go to um, help and keyboard shortcuts, it lists uh, the keyboard shortcuts. And it seems pretty comprehensive. Yep. Um, so those features might, in fact, be documented there. Yeah, so this is um, a screenshot of what Terrell was just talking about. Up on that upper panel above the um, audio video area where my picture is, there is a link to some help information. And if you click on that and then click on keyboard shortcuts, it will display um, some keyboard shortcuts for you. I um, copied and pasted that into a document which I sent you guys um, to, to um, save if you wanted to, so you do have it in two places. And I did read through that and couldn't find any information on using this particular tool. And I also looked in some other of the, the accessibility guide in some other areas in Blackboard, and I wasn't able to figure out how to get into this one using the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, but Jen and I, we do have this activity that we like to do um, because we're very curious where you all are. So um, we're going to use our uh, your mouse for just a second. Um, if you can find that the keyboard tools there in um, the middle between the whiteboard and the other panels, and um, if you click on the little sun icon that's there, you can select any sort of um, pointer that you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and grab the smiley face, and I'm going to plunk myself down here in Washington. This is kind of becoming a tradition with these webinars. Um, so those of you that have joined us before, you have done this before and know how to do this. Look, we have somebody in New York and somebody in Indiana and Texas. And this is why we expanded it to a US map instead of just Washington. Um, wow, Dakota, North Dakota, wow, this is fabulous, you guys. This is so exciting to see you all join us from um, various places. And yes, for those of you who um, haven't joined us before, we do know the maps in French. We needed an open image, and um, this is what I found. So Someone from Hawaii. Hawaii. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Hawaii? Oh my gosh. Wow. Awesome. I didn't see that one. Okay. Well, that was fabulously fun. That's probably, um, I think that's the most people we've had out of our Washington area. Um, so, great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. All right. Now, we're actually going to do a, a, an activity using um, our polling tool. And normally, I would show you how to use the polling tool, but we're not going to do it that way today because we're going to use the keyboard shortcuts instead. 
So um, before you start answering, I do know that I need to switch this over to uh, multiple choice. So okay, I've got that now. So what I want you to do is um, if you want to answer A, you need to click F1, B is F2, and C is F3, D is F4, and E is F5. And I'm going to go ahead and read this and the answers so um, that it can get into the transcript. So which, which hashtag is not associated with this webinar? A, pound A11Y, B, pound GAAD, C, or sorry, it's not pound, it's hashtag. That's my age showing, sorry. Hashtag no mouse. Uh, my kids get after me on that one. Uh, D, hashtag make tech edible, and E, none of the above. So if you guys would all go ahead and vote now um, using those keys. Unless I got it wrong. Is it control, Terrell? Oh, it is. Oh, my bad. It's control F1. Control F2. I'm Control I think it might actually be without uh, not the function keys, but the numbers. If I'm not mistaken, it's Control One, Control yeah. Two, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're on if you're on bad. Mac, uh, it's Command instead of Control. Yeah. So I'm actually going to revote because I don't like my answer. And sorry for that. It's Control and then um, the number for the answer that you want. Okay, so let's see if any of you all figured that out. Some of you have voted. Let me publish those tools or the um, poll to our board here so that we can um, see the results. Okay, so we have lots of D's and E's. So um, for those of you that uh, selected none of the above, um, maybe you didn't vote, not sure. Um, D was make tech edible. That one's probably kind of obvious, right? Okay. And um, make tech edible kind of technically is part of this webinar now because we're talking about it. So a um, little ambiguity there on the D and E answers for which one is and isn't right. All right. So um, the reason why we have um, the hashtags in here is um, because we want to remind you all to tweet during our um, during our webinar. So um, feel free to do that if you are a tweeter. All right, just some quick meeting etiquette. We do like you to raise your hand during um, when you'd like to speak. So uh, when you're ready to speak, do that, and we'll, we'll get you in the queue and call on you. Please use the emoticons. Um, that's kind of a fun way to um, communicate extra information. You do need to click your talk button when you do want to speak. So um, make sure that button is on when you want to talk and off when you don't want to be heard because we can hear all of the background information. And then um, for the chat window there, please type your questions for Terrell into the chat as we go, and we'll revisit them during the Q&A period at the end. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Jen now, who is going to introduce our presenter to you, and we'll get going. And again, my apologies for um, the crazy tech and mistakes I've made today. It's just been an absolutely just incredibly crazy week for me. So uh, Jen, take Thank it away. You. So and again, I think, too, one of the big things that we really hope to model with this series is that making mistakes is how we learn, <laughs> and that despite whatever challenges technology might throw at us, we remain calm, graceful, and still excited <laughs> about using it. So uh, Carol Thompson is Technology Accessibility Specialist with the University of Washington and do it. Disabilities, opportunities, internet working, and technology. His primary role is to promote information technology accessibility by developing resources, delivering lectures and workshops, providing consultation, and conducting research. He has nearly 20 years experience in the IT accessibility field, and he's presented internationally at numerous conferences and consulted widely with local and state government, private industry, K-12, and other post-secondary education entities. He is a wonderful presenter, um, and we are really lucky to have him. I have included, if you want to see his numerous talks along with PowerPoints and PDFs, I'm giving you the link. And Carol, thank you. Take it away. 
Thanks. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Um, again, uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Um, we actually are doing a lot of things here at the University of Washington, both hosting our own events as well as uh, we've kind of injected ourselves into um, other other meetings that um, and it didn't require a whole lot of effort to do that. People were receptive, but um, uh, I gave a presentation earlier today to the University Web Council and um, and then was involved in our Drupal user group uh, meeting, both regularly scheduled events, but just happened to coincide with uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So we were able to get some accessibility-related content um, out to the folks in those meetings. So that, that was great. And then we're also um, hosting some uh, uh, just kind of drop in um, and um, get an accessibility review of your website, free consultation, basically for anybody that wants that. So we're offering that as well. So so it's uh, an exciting day and um, great uh, great to be given this uh, webinar um, today as well. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, let's see. The interface looks a little bit different than it did the other day, so I may need a refresher on how to advance the slide. It's in, um, it's on the upper right corner, and there are little uh, white arrows. Yeah, I'm not seeing, right. I saw arrows the other day when we looked at this, but there are no longer any arrows. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure exactly what you're seeing, because I can't see what you're seeing, but um, we'd be happy to advance the slides for you. Okay, I'll just tell you when. And then you Hold can on. Holy cow, where did your stuff go? There you go. I was okay. one slide off in my upload, sorry. Okay, and this is just uh, my contact information. Um, Jennifer shared the URL from my um, my personal staff um, site. And um, that, uh, that that does have, as you mentioned, um, you know, uh, slides from previous presentations and, and so forth. Uh, there's another site that is uh, one that our group is actively working on, and we actually just rolled out, rolled out some significant changes to that will probably interest you. Um, that is the, the accessibility site at the UW, so just uw.edu slash accessibility. One of the features there is um, our, our new, just released um, today, actually, our new IT accessibility guidelines. Um, and an accompanying checklist. So we go into extensive detail on that site about some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. And um, that was developed for, really, for the entire campus community in mind. So uh, faculty, staff, e-learning folks, really anybody who's developing any sort of content, uh, we've got material up there for them. And so some of it's kind of high end, talking about web development stuff. Um, and some of it really is just for, for document authors, because anybody who's producing anything that is distributed digitally or making any decisions about purchasing products related to IT, um, you know, there are accessibility implications with that. And so that really is the message that we're trying to get out there, just get people thinking about um, accessibility. So great. I got my slide controller. So I don't know how you work that magic, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I had so, forgotten to make you a moderator. That's my fault. Oh, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, we're good. Good to go now. So, so one of those hashtags that was in that opening poll is A11Y, uh, which is a, a numeronym. So, the 11 actually is because accessibility is such a long word, and with Twitter, we're limited to 140 characters per tweet. And so if we wanted to have a hashtag um, that applied to this topic, accessibility was just going to be too long. And so um, this is a way of truncating that. So A11Y represents accessibility. So just a little trivia there. If folks didn't know that. But that, that's a very active hashtag. So if you are on Twitter, I actually have reached the point where that I monitor the A11Y hashtag um, pretty religiously. and it. It's like a stock ticker. There's constantly something happening in the accessible tech world and just in accessibility in general. And and I almost always find out about it on Twitter first. And then maybe a few days later, somebody will blog about it or post to a discussion list about it. But um, Twitter really is, is kind of um, the source for lots of really you know, up-to-the-minute information. Um, so 
so what is this accessibility thing anyway? What, what are we talking about? Um, the uh, this slide kind of demonstrates um, this in a way that um, that works for me. I think that we're looking at the, the I believe this is the U.S. Capitol building, and we've got several dozen pretty steep steps, and somehow we're at the base of those steps, and we need to get inside and participate in the government process. So, so the question then is. How do we do that? How do we actually get inside there if we are, let's imagine that we are um, a wheelchair user. And so we're at the bottom of these steps in a wheelchair um, needing to get inside and um, you know, the question is how do we do that? The wheelchair provides us with assistive technology. So if we're not able to walk, then it provides us with mobility. So that's one step um, towards getting us access. But the assistive technology alone doesn't doesn't meet our goal. It can't get us in here unless we have a really you know um, special wheelchair that has um, jet power and you know um, just incredible traction. And you know most wheelchairs are not going to be able to get us up those steps. So so the problem then needs to be solved in the building itself. That the building needs to be designed in a way. That will allow people to get in, whether you know they can walk up the steps or not. And so, so this is kind of a familiar sort of accessibility problem um, that the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 um, started working to address in the United States. Things like uh, ramps to get into buildings and elevators to get up to upper floors um, became required, and so that would be a solution. It's not that the person needs to change or that the person needs to be equipped with better assistive technology, but that the environment needs to change in, in order to better accommodate a wider variety of um, user characteristics. And so, so I present this really as a metaphor. We're here to talk about technology and online learning and the kind of tools that we use for delivering education in a, in a digital world. But the metaphor really is the same, that People with disabilities will be using a variety of different tools. Um, some will be using assistive technology. Some will be using different configurations and so forth. But that isn't necessarily going to get them access. We also have to design the materials, design the software, design the web tools in a way that is going to uh, provide access. And so they're really, you know, there are responsibilities kind of for all parties in um, making making the digital world more accessible. So we've got a slide here that shows the typical computer user um, with maybe quotes around typical. Um, it it's a silhouette of a person who's seated at a um, at a workstation, and not everybody necessarily is sitting as they're using the computer. They're also looking at a monitor, on a rather big monitor. Um, so that looks probably not so typical by today's standards. And they're operating some sort of device with their hands, either a you know, keyboard or a mouse. And in a lot of ways, this is pretty old-fashioned. And so um, if, uh, if sometimes when I guess, show this slide to a live audience, I'll ask, you know, how many of you are typical computer users? And, you know, usually about half the, half the room will raise their hands. The other half doesn't feel like they really quite relate to this. Um, and I can understand that, that, you know, the world is changing. And this might have been typical you know, a couple of decades ago, but it's not so typical now. We have a much more broad spectrum in terms of how people are interacting with technology and how people are ac accessing online content. And so the old school model of a, a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse still plays some role. There's still people that access information that way. But you also have people who are accessing, a lot of people, in fact, accessing information on their phone. Um, and within that world, you've got different varieties of phones, different shapes, different sizes, different platforms. You've got tablets, so completely different um, size and shape and, and interface. Um, you have people who are not accessing content visually at all, but are listening to it. And that might be somebody 
who is blind. It might be somebody with a learning disability who is maybe they can see the content, but they have difficulty reading it, and so they're um, getting audible output, maybe reading and following along as they scan. Um, maybe it's just somebody in their car, and you know there are tools now that can read content, and so so they're accessing information audibly just like you know, that blind person is. Um, you also have speech input. So somebody who isn't able to use their hands, for example, might be using Dragon Naturally Speaking and controlling the computer entirely, dictating documents as well as controlling web pages and controlling software and you know, clicking buttons and following links and so forth entirely by voice. Um, and you get a lot of people outside of you know, people traditionally with uh, um, disabilities, people with physical disabilities who might have been using this. Um, we get a lot more people just using it now because it's faster. We can actually talk a lot faster than we can type um, for the most part. And so, um, so it is becoming a more and more viable product as speech recognition becomes more accurate. Um, and we've got in the center of the, the screen here, we have a refreshable Braille device. And so somebody might be using a tactile interface. So they're not getting information visually or audibly, but through touch. So the row of Braille dots refreshes as they explore the uh, the web page or the document and so forth. So so there's just a, a really rich variety of different technologies and different configurations. And these are just ones I could fit on a slide. I could go on and on and on and talk, you know, really for hours about different technologies that people are using to access online content. And so with that kind of variety, that raises a lot of questions about, you know, how technologies need to be designed in ways that are capable of working with all these different um, devices. And so the technologies are diverse and the people are diverse who are using those technologies. Um, these are photos of people who participate in the Do It program um, that was uh, in my introduction. It, um, I, I work with the Do It Center here at the University of Washington. And one of the projects that we've had um, since 1993, actually, it's been a long time running, we're still still doing it, is a, a summer study session where kids with disabilities starting from sophomore in high school, um, they come to the university for a, a summer immersion program. They spend a couple weeks uh, staying in the dorms and, and taking academic classes with, um, you know, with faculty and learning. Um, what sort of accommodations to expect in a college environment and getting hooked up with uh, peers, uh, kids with disabilities who are in college or people with disabilities who have gone on to working in challenging careers. And as we kind of look through, just sort of skimming through this, these photos, we see a lot of, um, a lot of differences. They're, um, kids who are wearing microphones, so they're using speech input to control the computer. You've got people who are using um, a, a, the, the girl in the lower left corner is using a uh, large keyboard where the keys are large. She uses that um, as a, a bigger target than um, a regular keyboard. And then she's holding a stick in her right hand and presses the keys with the stick. Um, so she has limited mobility um, and is not able to use a mouse effectively, but can use the keyboard to navigate around. And so, um, so you all perhaps are um, accepting the challenge to try and get around here in Blackboard Collaborate without a mouse, that would be the kind of experience that, that she would have. And so questions then arise, you know, how accessible is this environment if you're not able to, to click? Um, it's difficult to resist the urge. Um, in fact, right after the, um, uh, the announcement that we're going to be mouse-free here in today's session um, came the instruction to click on the CC button to get the caption panel. And so that's, you know, it's hard to resist that urge to click on something, particularly if you wanted to see the caption panel and you didn't know how to get there. You know, there's a very tempting button right there. But if you can't use the mouse, then how do you get to that CC button? There actually is a way here in Blackboard Collaborate. It's, um, uh, I believe it's Control F8 toggles the caption panel. And so, but that's, you know, something that um, you would have to you know, get familiar with those keystrokes as a, a non-mouser. And some tools are not going to be as accessible as Blackboard Collaborate is. And so those are the kind of questions we have to ask as educators as we're picking, you know, what tools we're going to use 
does this work without a mouse? That's that's a, actually a fairly simple thing to test, um, you know. And if you can't figure out how to get it to work, ask the vendor. And you know, if it works without a mouse, um, then they would be able to tell you what what keystrokes are and point you towards the documentation um, for that. So, um, so let me let me move on just to to say that you know, kind of this notion of people with disabilities, people without disabilities is really sort of a false dichotomy that, yeah, I'd, I'd like to sort of think of it in a different way that depending on what skill is required for a particular function or a particular task, then we all fall, fall somewhere on, on a continuum and some can do that better than, than others. And so like the ability to see, for example, some have 20-20 vision, some can't see at all. Um, some vary. I actually had a really hard time this morning in my web council um, presentation. I have um, eyesight that require reading glasses, and I somehow misplaced those prior to my session. <laughs> so I couldn't, couldn't see my slides on the screen, um, on my screen, but I could turn around and see the screen projected much larger, and I could, you know, so that was my kind of workaround solution. But without those reading glasses, I fell pretty low on the spectrum. But the bottom line is, you know, everybody falls somewhere other than the extremes, or you know, there are people on both extremes, but there are also a lot of people in the middle, and so um, so it just really varies, and this um, serves to sort of stress that there is this rich diversity and uh, you know a lot of differences among people, and they're all going to be accessing digital content in different ways and have different needs when it comes to to digital content. So um, uh, just another hashtag, again, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, GAD. There's a lot of um, tweeting, and, and hashtags now apply to other um, social networking venues as well. So a lot of um, stuff happening on Facebook as well and probably elsewhere um, related to this day. And um, again, it is Global Accessibility Awareness Day that was created a few years ago just to sort of raise awareness about the need for mostly for technology accessibility and digital accessibility. Um, and this is a new one, um, the no mouse hashtag, which we actually um, launched just a couple days ago, sort of in the build up for GAD. And what we're doing is encouraging people to just try their web pages or you know, if they're associated with an organization at all, or if they have their own web page, um, to just try that page or that site without a mouse, or maybe spend an entire day, or maybe just spend a half an hour just navigating without a mouse and see what happens. And it's one of many accessibility issues, but it's the easiest one to test. Um, here in Blackboard Collaborate, as we've seen, there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts. And so if you can memorize the keyboard shortcuts or keep the cheat sheet handy, then um, you can get around and you can access pretty much anything. Um, Maybe with a few exceptions, it sounds like there there are a few things that seem to be out of reach um, for for non-mousers. But one of the challenges, like for example, if some of you've been playing around with this, um, F6 actually moves between the different modules, so you can go like from the participants module to the chat module, and then over to the main slide area um, with F6 and Shift F6 to go backwards. And that actually does work, but I wasn't sure it was working when I first tried it because it's really hard to tell where you are. And so that's kind of a key to keyboard accessibility is visible focus, providing a visual way to keep track of where you are if you're not a mouse user. And this is a big problem on web pages that is actually really, really easy to fix on web pages with cascading style sheets. And so um, that's uh, part of our, our motivation and encouraging people to do this today with their web pages is that we also have a solution. So if they try it and they say, wow, I have no idea where I am on the page, then we've got something to show them that you know, they can they can fix that you know, in five minutes and it'll make a world of difference for, for keyboard users and, and really anybody who's tabbing through um, a web page rather than using a mouse. A lot of people do that just because it's more efficient. So, so I encourage you to even after our session, continue to do this, and please continue to spread the word uh, with the no mouse hashtag. And we've got a website set up that provides some more information about this at nomouse.org. 
So I encourage you to check that out. So um, since I think there are more smiley faces and icons and um, so forth in Washington than elsewhere, uh, I wanted to talk about Canvas because that is a learning management system that we're using widely here in Washington. Um, and what I'm about to say, for the most part, other than the fact that I mentioned names here on this slide, uh, for the most part, this applies to other learning management systems as well. I've done quite a bit of work in, in Blackboard and Desire to Learn, um, as well as now Canvas. And, and they're all working on accessibility. And I think probably everything I'm about to say is true for, for all of them. But within Canvas specifically, um, because it plays such a key role in Washington, I wanted to, to talk about some of the details that, that they do have an accessibility project manager um, named Dana Danger, which is a, a really awesome name. Um, and she, uh, she works closely with a software engineer that they hired just last October named Aaron Cannon. And he is dedicated to accessibility. So that's his sole function or his primary function is he's working on accessibility issues on Canvas. Um, they've also trained a number of developers um, throughout the organization on accessibility. And they have QA engineers who have accessibility experience, and they're training them, actively training them as well to test the product with accessibility in mind and to run accessibility tests. And um, according to Dana and Aaron, they, they also have high level understanding that accessibility is important and executives who support their accessibility initiative. So they, they really feel like they've got strong um, corporate backing on their accessibility initiatives. So um, I also, also want to talk about an organization that I belong to called Access Technology Higher Education Network, or AFN. This is a group that was founded in 2002 at the CSUN conference on technology and disability. And um, it's people who work in higher education and have some interest in accessible technology. So a lot of the people who do the kind of work that I do, just being a technology accessibility person on a, on a college campus, are members of this organization, as are people who do alt format production or people working in disability services environments, um, and a growing number of just people who are ed, ed tech people, um, e-learning people who have an interest in accessibility. Um, so it is an accessibility-focused organization. But one of the things that they have a long history of doing since their founding is getting people together who all share a, a product that they are working with on their campus and have a concern for accessibility of that product. Then the more people you can get together who represent the client base of a company or a potential client base, even better, um, get them all together and approach the vendor and say, hey, we need to do something about the accessibility of this product, then a lot of times vendors will, will listen. Um, so there's basically the strength in numbers. And so this is how the collaboration with Canvas began. Uh, we actually became aware of accessibility problems here at the University of Washington and started talking to our Canvas reps about that. Um, and then we, we kind of got our foot in the door and started having a small conversation with them, but then posted a list to the, to the Athen discussion, or posted a, a, a query to the Athen discussion list saying, anybody else using Canvas that wants to uh, help us you know, collaborate with them on making their product more accessible? And, and we got uh, initially a handful of people. Um, right out of the gate, I think there were seven or eight of us that were working together. We did a fairly comprehensive assessment of Canvas. This was a couple of years ago now. Um, found quite a few accessibility problems um, and, and shared that within structure. Uh, they agreed to meet with us. And we gradually have, have just grown over the years, over the last couple of years. And uh, now there are 83 active participants in the group. And last year, there were 396 accessibility bugs fixed. Um, Partly, I think, at, at least partly, and maybe you know, we even deserve more credit than that, um, because of this group, this collaboration, where we have a Canvas course where we collaborate, and representatives from Instructure are present there in that course. And we all um, you know, talk about accessibility issues. 
document those issues, test those issues, and then um, in structure fixes those issues and reports back to us. So it's really matured into to a good relationship, I think. Um, so, so Canvas, by now, it was a little rocky at first a couple years ago, but by now I'm pretty comfortable saying they understand accessibility and they're, they're working hard. They still have problems, but they're working hard to fix those problems and not just within their product, but within their organization. And I'm pretty confident with what Instructure is doing with Canvas. So, but that said, just like with any other LMS, it's possible to have an accessible course in Canvas, but it's also possible to have an inaccessible course in Canvas. So that really depends on the instructor and how they deliver their, their content. And so I want to spend some time exploring that. What are the instructor's responsibilities when it comes to accessibility within their courses? So course accessibility, we can really simplify it. It can be more complex than this, but, but really it comes down, if we just look at kind of the low-hanging fruit and the more, most important things that we see on a regular basis, there are five simple steps for making your course accessible. One is use headings. Two is add alternate text to images. Three is caption your videos. Four is upload accessible course materials. And five is ask questions about accessibility before selecting other features or tools. So let me expand on each of those. First of all, headings. What we're looking at now is an introduction to physics course syllabus that um, has no structure. It's just text. It's a big blur of text, really. And if you try to read it, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And if I asked you, uh, what's the reading assignment in week three? Or how many course objectives are there? Or how much of your grade is exam two worth? Um, then you're going to be really having a hard time trying to answer those questions. But this is exactly what it's like to read a web page or a document with a screen reader if there's no structure. So this content of this document actually visibly looks like this. So this is the actual syllabus. Um, and you, we can see there's a, a graphic at the top that's kind of the logo, and then there, there, there's a heading, a main heading, Introduction to Physics Course Syllabus. There are subheadings like textbook course objectives. There are three objectives, and we can see that it has um, a list of bulleted, a bulleted list of items. There are two tables. And we can see the structure of those tables, and we can very easily tell, you know, what the um, the assignment is, what the topic is during week two, and what the reading assignment is, and so forth. All of the structure here, though, is visual. So we can tell something's a heading because it's big and it's bold and maybe it's centered. We can tell it's a table because it has lines that sort of guide our eyesight. And so in order for this to be accessible to people who aren't looking at it visually, then there needs to be um, a, an underlying tag structure, which is what web pages are designed with. Um, you know, HTML is a tag structure that allows you to communicate this sort of, um, you know, the, the heading level and, you know, that this list is actually a list and this is a table and this is a table header and all of that sort of information um, really is critical for accessibility. So headings, more than anything else, um, communicate to a screen reader user what the structure of the document is, sort of as an outline, and, and allows them to jump from heading to heading to heading, and so they can navigate the, the document more efficiently. So it's very important to make sure those headings actually are marked up as headings. So in Canvas, when you're using their built-in editor to create content, then you've got a, an option within the toolbar to select what sort of content this particular item is, and it includes headings in there. And so, um, so as you're building your content, then just make sure that you use that to identify the level two heading and the level three heading and so forth. And in the screenshot, we see that it starts at heading two. This actually is a really good feature of Canvas and, and some other environments as well. But the title of your document is um, of your the page that you're creating within their form 
is actually going to be used automatically as the heading one on the page. And so you kind of need to understand that as you author the content then, that the, the highest level you're going to have within your content is a heading two. And then if you have subsections within that that have headings above them, then you know, those would be heading three and so forth. Again, just sort of keeping in mind that you need to create an outline with your heading structure. Um, and headings apply to all document types, not just uh, web pages, but when you're creating a Microsoft Word file, um, use the built-in heading styles. So you've got heading one, heading two, and so forth. And those are communicated to assistive technology users. And so um, it's always important, regardless of what tool you're using to create a document, to make sure that you're communicating that this is a heading, this is a subheading, this is a sub-subheading. Step two is to add alternate text to images. And so uh, we've got an example here from Canvas where we're adding an image or using Flickr, which is built into Canvas. And uh, I grab a picture of Mount Rainier, which is suitable for my course. And it actually automatically adds alt text to that. Um, I believe that, I don't know if, if it only gets images off of Flickr that have alt text or if every image on Flickr um, has alt text, but it seems to always populate those fairly accurately. And so you've got then alt text for Mount Rainier, um, which then brings me to this slide, which is a Mount Rainier photo. Um, and the question is, what is suitable alt text for that? If somebody can't see it, what's the best way to describe that photo? And uh, we were going to do this as a two-part exercise where you type in an answer. Uh, but we'll just give you some, because we're running short on time, we'll just give you a poll with a few answers, and you can pick which of the following you think is the best um, answer. And so, whoops, I keep, uh, if somebody keeps advancing or I keep advancing. <laughs> okay, there we go. So we got, again, uh, the user keyboard, Control-1 will give you option A, which is Mount Rainier. Control-2 is option B, photo of Mount Rainier. Control C, an aerial photo of Mount Rainier from the northwest on a clear blue summer day. Control uh, 4, which is D, photo of Mount Rainier from the northwest showing the receding Russell Glacier. Or Control 5, which is E, the Termigan Ridge, a grade 3 climb on mixed terrain with a 5.8 pitch on rock. So we'll give you uh, just a few seconds to wrap that up. and. Um, Either Alyssa or Jen, I'll let you guys close it when you feel that's appropriate. Doesn't look like we have any voting going on yet. I know personally I'm having a little trouble um, trying to decide which one of those is the best description. I'm going to flip back to the image for just one second so you can all look at that one more time. The question is, which of the options is the best alt text description for this picture. So here's the picture, beautiful picture of Mount Rainier. Okay, and then your options to choose from for alt text are A, Mount Rainier, B, photo of Mount Rainier, C, aerial photo of Mount Rainier from the northwest on a clear blue summer day, D, photo of Mount Rainier from northwest showing the receding Russell Glacier, and E, Ptarmigan Ridge, a grade three climb on mixed terrain with a 5.8 pitch on the rock. And again, use your control and a number. So control one is A, control two is B, control three is C, control four is D, and control five is E. Um, and if you're on a Mac, command, you're that's command. Right. Oh, it looks like Jennifer has gone ahead and published those for us. Um, I hope that was okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to um, give everybody a chance to, to really think through it and make sure that we got the answers into the transcript. I was in a webinar this morning, um, and it was a speaker on accessibility, and um, she actually read through and did descriptions of every single picture and everything. So um, I learned a little bit this morning. That's why I'm kind of spending a lot of time reading stuff to, to make sure that um, it actually gets into the transcript. So, all right, so a lot of you answered C. And that was an aerial photo of Mount Rainier from the northwest on a clear blue summer day. I'm going to turn it back to 
Carol now and let him talk about those answers. Okay. Well, Lisa Cade in the chat said, uh, uh, what do you say? It's scrolled past. Okay. It depends on the context. And uh, Lisa, we here at the UW, we've been giving away shirts um, that say no mouse <laughs> and have a little no mouse logo on them. And so if I could, I would uh, share that with you uh, for getting the right answer that it really depends that a photo of Mount Rainier um, you know, on one page is going to be different than on another. Option D, for example, about the Russell Glacier might be appropriate for a geology course um, or a climate change course. And um, E, about the, uh, the, the climbing route might be appropriate for a climbing website. So it really just depends on the context. And so even when you're adding an image in Canvas and, and using the Flickr option to grab a, um, an open source licensed image and it pre-populates that alt text, then you always have to think about what am I trying to communicate with this image and maybe you need to change that alt text to something that is more meaningful for your particular context. So um, do we have to stop right at three, or is there an opportunity to con continue on? Um, I think because I wasted the first 10 minutes of our time with technical problems that we should let you finish. And anybody that needs to um, go ahead and um, leave now because we're approaching the 3 o'clock hour, that's totally fine. You will be able to access this recording on the assessment teaching and learning blog. So um, don't worry about that. If you missed the last few minutes, um, you can come back and listen to it. Okay. So I'll try to get through this quickly because I, I would like there to be, you know, some opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so, so folks have, you know, an additional five minutes or so, then it'd be great if you could stick around. But again, it's up to you. Um, but so step three is add captions to videos. So more and more of us are using video in our instruction. Um, and there are lots of good reasons to, to caption that. Um, and what we're seeing on the screen here is a, a video player that we actually developed um, called Able Player. It's free and open source and fully accessible. And kind of the goal was to demonstrate how accessibility features can provide so many benefits to so many people. Um, and you know, with captions, for example, you can create an interactive transcript. And so somebody can click anywhere in that transcript and start the video at that point. And it's fully searchable, so you can search for, you know, search an entire video or entire video library. So this is really powerful when we're talking about lecture capture where you know, a student is trying to trying to prepare for the exam, and if something was said in a lecture, but they can't remember which lecture it was. They're trying to find that content, and you know, not only do they have to figure out which lecture it was, but then when they figure out which lecture it was, they've got to watch you know an entire course, an entire class period video, you know, scrolling back and forth and trying to figure out you know where that was. And if you could just search video, that would be so much easier for everybody. And so there was a question really early on. Um, as we were kind of uh, just getting acquainted at the beginning, somebody typed into the chat about how captioning is still too too difficult and too expensive. And so kind of the, the card that we're playing now is that this is something, it's not just for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but it's something that benefits everybody, that it really is a feature of video, that if you've got video that isn't searchable, and that doesn't have this interactive transcript component, then um, it's not nearly as valuable to all students as it would be if it were captioned. And so, and you know, maybe people can find the funds, um, you know, if that's that's the argument. And so that's kind of what we're working toward at this point, anyway. Um, not necessarily there yet, but but I think there's some uh, viability to that argument. It actually is very easy to caption now. It still does have a cost associated with it, either time or, or money. But YouTube, for example, supports captions have for, for a few years now. And it's very easy within the YouTube interface to upload captions. And YouTube automatically tries to caption, but they don't do a very good job. Um, but if they do a halfway decent job, then it might be feasible to just go in and edit the captions that YouTube automatically comes up with. So that's a possibility. Caption files are actually just plain text files. So you could write your own captions in Notepad or you know, any other text editor. 
is just a timestamp with some text that follows it. And there are various formats, various file types, and slightly different syntax for each one. But essentially, it just comes down to that, some text with a timestamp. It's um, pretty laborious to write it out by hand, and so not too many people do that. But it is doable, and so um, not, uh, not particularly difficult, just time consuming. And then there are lots of free tools that have cropped up um, that help you caption. And so this is one that I use a lot called Amara um, that was designed to support crowdsourcing of both captioning and subtitling. So you can put a video up there, and then the crowd can jump on it, and they can do the captioning for you. Or you can have a, you know, a team of volunteers that uses the Amara interface to do, uh, do the captioning. So. Um, works really well, and it actually makes. We've had some students doing work in Amara that have reported back that it was fun, that they really enjoyed doing the work, and it helped them to master the material that much better. If they were in a class, you know, then actually typing the content of that class really helps them to learn it. So that's um, good feedback we've gotten. So step four: upload accessible course content. So if you're creating you know, Microsoft Word documents, PowerPoint files, PDFs, follow some steps to be sure those are accessible and get educated about the accessibility of those document formats. And the, the rules about those are the same for web pages. So you know, making sure you got good heading structure, making sure you got all text on images, that's all possible with all of these formats that I've mentioned and, and many more formats. Um, you know, basic accessibility is possible with those formats, so you just need to do a little bit of research and find out how, how to do that. Um, Adobe PDF is a, a particularly tricky one. Um, there are three general types of PDF. There's just a, an image that has no actual text in it. So that obviously is the least accessible type. Um, image with embedded fonts is um, yeah, a little bit better because there's actually some text there that can be read, but there's no structure. So it's kind of similar to that slide I showed early on, a bunch of text in no particular order with no sort of structural relevance. Very difficult for anybody to read. Um, the third type is really the type that we're shooting for, and that is a tagged PDF um, that has an underlying tag structure and is optimized for accessibility. So how do we produce a tagged PDF? Um, first of all, you can check and see if you have a PDF, um, just open it up in, in Adobe Acrobat and check to see if it's tagged with Control D in Windows or Command D in, on the Mac. And uh, there's an option um, that says tagged PDF. It'll either be yes or no. And uh, that pops up in the document properties dialog. And so that's one way, just a quick check and see if your document even has the underlying tag structure that, is, that makes accessibility possible. So most PDFs, um, frankly, don't. And so that's a problem that, um, that we all really need to address. To create an accessible PDF, we need to use an authoring tool that supports the things we've been talking about. So adding headings, adding subheadings, adding alt text to images, and so forth. And we need to then, it needs to support exporting to a tagged PDF. So a couple of examples, Microsoft Word for Windows exports to tagged PDF by default. And so if you make sure that you use the heading styles in Word and add alt text to your images in Word, then when you export to tagged PDF, you will get an accessible PDF. It passes that structure on to the PDF through the export process. On the other hand, if you're using Word for Mac, it does not export to a tag PDF. So it does all the same things. You can add all the accessibility features to your Word file, but when you export, you lose that information. And so um, that's hopefully they're going to fix that in the upcoming version of Word for Mac, but um, I, I haven't had a chance to look into that yet. So there's some other tools that support tag PDF. Uh, WordPerfect is still around and does. OpenOffice, LibreOffice, Lotus Symphony all support tag PDF. Uh, Adobe InDesign also does. Um, and even if you have a document that does not have accessibility built into it, a PDF document, you can fix that with Adobe Acrobat Pro. There's a complete workflow that's documented on our website. website 
It allows you to do, use Acrobat Pro to add tags and make sure those tags are correct and so forth. And here's a screenshot that just kind of shows you some of those features. Um, so step five, the final step, is ask questions about accessibility before selecting other features or tools. So uh, the one we've been asking today as we look at Collaborate, um, can you use this with a keyboard, you know, or does somebody have to be a mouse user? Um, that, that's probably going to be in, indicative of how accessible it is for, for other users as well. So that really is an important question to ask and one that's very easy to test. Um, here's uh, just an example from within Canvas, uh, the discussion forum, which a lot of courses use. Um, if somebody is a screen reader user, and you've got a topic that somebody posts, and somebody else replies to that, somebody else replies to the reply, and then somebody else, again, replies to the original, then how do you know who's replying to who? Is How is all that communicated? Visually, it's communicated with a slight indentation and you know, just a little bit of um, uh, you know, kind of the way the, the replies are positioned on the screen. But um, you know, how is that communicated under the hood so that a screen reader user would understand the relationships between all these parts? Um, so that's a question that's difficult to answer unless you, you know, are, are a web developer and can, can look under the hood and sort of, you know, figure that out. But that's where having these conversations with the vendor, you know, just to ask that question and see how they respond to it can really be um, educational. Either they can answer that, somebody at the organization can answer that, or, or they can't. And as it turns out, uh, Canvas actually has done some really progressive of coding to make sure that this discussion forum does have that underlying structure so that it works for somebody who's um, a, a non-visual user. On the other hand, Canvas also has um, third-party plugins or third-party tools that work as part of their environment. Um, so if you click on the conferencing uh, button within the main menu of a, a Canvas course by default, um, that is going to uh, link to Big Blue Button, which is this tool that they use for conferencing. And for collaboration, you've got a choice between Etherpad and uh, Google Apps. And, and then there are you know, millions of other, uh, or at least hundreds of other uh, tools that can plug into the Canvas environment. Um, and so with each of these tools, we have to ask these same questions. You know, is this accessible? And to have that conversation um, with the vendor. And in, in the case of both of these tools, it's neither of these are great. The ones that we have here, they, they fall short of where Canvas is on accessibility. Both of these can be very difficult for a lot of different user groups to, to use. And so, so then the question is, it becomes sort of up to a, an instructor and whoever is providing support to that instructor to figure out, is this tool accessible? And if it has shortcomings, then you know, is that a, a showstopper? Does that mean we're not going to be able to use that in this course, particularly if you have a student registered that has a disability, and that would mean they're not going to be able to participate in the, the class activities? So those are the kind of questions that need to come up. And it, you know, it's going to be on a tool-by-tool -tool, um, basis. So just one final slide, then, are the resources I want to point toward, uh, point you towards. The, the first one there really is kind of a the hub of all sorts of accessibility information. So uw.edu slash accessibility. That's where you'll find our new guidelines and the new checklist and lots of other resources that we've had up there for a while prior to now. So uh, I encourage you to check that out, as well as um, the, uh, the websites for the different programs that I'm funded by. Um, uw.edu slash access computing is our <coughs> access computing project for broadening participation of individuals with disabilities in computing careers. And um, as we mentioned, do it. Do it's website is uw.edu slash do it. So we're about 10 minutes over. And it looks like we still have a lot of people that have stuck around. So I really appreciate that. Um, and, <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice <laughs> just in time. But I'm happy to uh, take a swig of water, water and see if I can answer any questions that folks have. Yes, go ahead and raise your hand to ask questions or type them into the chat.
looks like Mara might be typing a question. We'll wait just a second for that to come in. Oh, she missed the answer to the not renewal question. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, uh, so the answer to the, the Mount Rainier question was just that uh, there is no right or wrong alt text. The idea is that you need to uh, communicate whatever it is you're trying to communicate with the image, and that's going to vary depending on the context that that image is presented in. I was just going to say uh, regarding your comment, Alyssa, that uh, regarding the default YouTube player, that's actually somewhat complicated because there are two YouTube players. There's the Flash version and the HTML5 version. Um, and I've got, if you go to my blog on uh, terrellthompson.com, uh, my latest post actually is a fairly technical article, but about the YouTube player and Able Player, the, the successful player that we built, actually does play YouTube video. So that would be a nice alternative is use Able Player to play YouTube video. And that's fully accessible. But the HTML5 player for YouTube that is embedded is is pretty accessible. Um, it's not not great, but it's um, you know not not bad either. That it's got labels on all the buttons and it's keyboard accessible and um, and you know has caption support and, and that sort of thing. But um, if a user happens to get the Flash player delivered to them, and that that's you know kind of the gray area, is that sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Then the Flash player is very inaccessible or has a lot of accessibility problems. Yeah, I'm not sure which one she was talking about. She didn't say Flash or HTML5. She um, just mentioned that the default player. And so it was something I was definitely going to investigate some more. So I will go look at your blog and see what you've got on that. Thanks. Sure. Anybody else? You guys are a pretty silent group today. Um, if there are no other questions, I can go ahead and close out the webinar and get you all on your way for the day. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, in our presentation, you will find some additional resources. Again, all of the resources are available on the ATL blog. So you can go and get our slide deck, Terrell's slide deck, uh, the transcript we'll put there, and um, any of the other documents I sent out earlier. So here's how you find the recording. You just go to the ATL blog and go to the IGNIS section and click on webinar recordings for the 2015 IGNIS and you'll be able to find the resources and the recordings from the webinar there. And then here's our contact information in case anybody has follow-up questions. Uh, please feel free to send those to us. And then um, we do like to have you guys um, tell us how we did. So uh, there's a survey that we'll ask you to complete. The survey link will be on the uh, ATL blog as well. But I'm going to go grab that link for you right now. So if you just want to click on it, you can. Let me just copy that real quick. And I'll bring it back and paste it into the chat for you. So you can go ahead and just click this link here and go right to uh, the, the survey if you'd like to do that for us. And again, my apologies for the rocky start today, uh, just some unexpected technical issues. So um, I think it all worked out OK. And could you um, join us next week if you want to do this again? Our last webinar of this season is on May 28th. And it's a follow-up to this presentation. And it's five easy steps to an accessible syllabus. So it's a bring your own syllabus uh, party. And um, if you don't have a syllabus because maybe you're not faculty, please feel free to bring any type of document that you would like to work on. There will be some work time given during the um, webinar to practice some of the things that our speaker is going to present on. Um, Amy Rovner is going to be speaking. She's from the faculty learning community on um, accessibility at Shoreline Community College. If you attended their uh, accessibility retreat this year, um, it's the same group. I'm not sure if she's bringing the other speakers with her, um, but that's what we're looking forward to next week. 
So um, again, thank you to our captioning sponsor today for um, doing this for us. It was a great experience. We really liked having the captions available. And I think we'll look forward to doing that maybe um, for all of our webinars next year. And again, thank you all for tuning in and joining us. So um, if there are no other questions, we'll just go ahead and stop our recording. And thank you again for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. I should also thank our presenter again. I'm so sorry, Terrell. I think I thanked everybody a thousand times. But yes, um, thank you again for um, hanging out with us for the hour and for sharing your knowledge with us. We much appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you.